Good morning. Glad that you're here. Um, we'll start with our opening story. Okay. Oh, sorry. I got to turn down the sound here. There we go. So let me try it again. Here we go. Technical difficulty, sorry. After a tiring Sunday, the pa pastor went home riding in a taxi. He was about to go get off, and so he paid the driver, and the driver handed him his change. The pastor noticed that the driver just gave him too much money. So he returned the money to the driver and said, Sir, you gave me too much change. The driver replied, I know it was my first time to attend a church service this morning and I heard you preach about honesty. So I thought maybe I could put you to the test to see if you're really doing what you're preaching. Titus 2 verse 7, in everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity. Okay, so people are always watching, right? We're supposed to be the example. We're supposed to be the light, the salt. We're supposed to be the ones that are making an impact on the world around us. If we're not doing it, nobody's doing it. So I encourage you to be the one that shows integrity today, wherever you're going to be at. Okay. So let's open with prayer and then we'll get into our word. Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you that um, you've given us a new day. You've given us the ability to make an impact on those around us. And I just pray that you would just bless this day. I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that I would be able to understand your word, that I would be able to preach it to those that are listening. And I pray that you would just um, get all the glory and honor in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Starting with overcoming the world. Overcoming the world and worldliness, right? We're going to start in Ezra 4, 1 through 5. And here we go. Ezra 4, 1 through 5. Ezra 4, 1 through 5. Okay. So the book of Ezra. Um, Ezra... First, Second Chronicles, First, Second Kings. No, First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. So it's right there before Job. Okay, it's a kind of smaller book, Ezra. So Ezra is wanting to rebuild the temple, and we see here in Ezra four, one through five, that he's going to face some opposition to trying to rebuild the temple. And I don't know about you, but anytime you try to do what God has told you to do, you know you're doing what God's told you to do when you face opposition, right? Okay, so we see here. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you, we have, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Eshardon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Okay, let's, let's go a little farther. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build the temple to our God, we alone will build it for the Lord God of Israel as King of, um, as King Cyrus, the King of Persia commanded us. Okay, so they're just wanting to help, right? They were enemies, but maybe they've changed their hearts. Maybe they are wanting to try and just get on the right side, right? No, no, that's not the case. I kind of see that as the case because I see people, sometimes my husband says, through rose-colored glasses, and I try to see the good in all situations, but sometimes that's not the case. And what the case is here is, these people are enemies of Judah. They're not wanting to help to be helpful. They're wanting to help to cause dissension, to cause a problem. Um, 
their enemies and they were they wanted to continue to worship their own gods and to continue to help and try to do this with these with the Israelites which was going to continue which was going to cause all kinds of problems right okay so then the peoples around them so now we know that their hearts weren't right because look what they do then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building they hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So you see when there is a problem and you do stand for what's right because God has told you to do it this way and you stand for that, you're going to face opposition. You're going to face those that are coming against you because... They don't want you to succeed in the Lord, right? The devil doesn't want you to succeed. So when you're facing opposition and you're doing what God's called you, you know you're in the right spot. And that's what happened with these. Um, the reason they had been sacrificing to him since the time of Eshron, king of Assyria, who brought us here, they're talking about when Assyria would conquer a land, they would take out the people of that land and bring in other peoples to that land so then all those peoples are misplaced and then they just don't know who to start worshiping so then misplaced people start worshiping God but they really aren't the chosen people anymore they're just they're people that have been brought in so they really weren't loyal to God even though they were living in the land God had promised the Israelites so that's why their hearts were wrong. So we need to be careful that when God has given us a plan and a direction, we overcome the world by staying true to what God... Oh, good morning, Paul. Um, yeah, it's Monday. <laughs> um, we stay true to what God has put in our hearts to do. And that's what they did. Yeah, and that's why they faced opposition. So now, what do we do when we face opposition? Um, Psalms 34, 1 through 3. Psalms 34, 1 through 3. Psalms 34, 1 through 3. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. Let us exalt his name together. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how do we praise the Lord? We extol the Lord at all times. Extol. We're going to give him honor. Give him glory. Give him props. Lift up his name. It's all because of him. It's not because of us. Giving him the glory and the honor in any and every situation. We're going to praise him with our lips. What are we saying? What are we doing? We need to make sure that what we're saying and what we're doing is giving him glory and honor at all times. I know you can't see it, but every time I see you preach, I smile. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Up until now, it never smiled back. Well, that's very cool. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that I can give you a smile this morning. Um, Paul. I'm talking to Paul. I can see messages on here. I know those of you that are watching on the video don't see the messages, but that's why I'm smiling and that's why I was talking to Paul. So it's always a blessing to be able to do it live stream. So if you are watching live stream, make sure that you make comments. It's always fun. And for those of you that are not watching live, that's what's going on. Um... So we're giving praise with our lips. Our soul boasts in the Lord. What is your soul boasting? Your soul is the only thing that you have that has eternal value. Your soul is boasting in the Lord, meaning that your eternity, your hope, your future, who you are and what will last through all time is boasting in the Lord. If it's not boasting in the Lord, then it's boasting in yourself, then it's boasting in something that's here and tangible and is not eternal. So that's why we're boasting in the Lord. That's why our soul and everything within us that has eternal value is boasting in the Lord, right? Um, the afflicted hear and rejoice. We are all afflicted at some point in time, and we have all faced opposition, just like we were talking about in the first scripture. But with that affliction... We need to hear what God has for us, and we need to rejoice in what it is, because that gives us our hope. That gives us our future. That helps our soul to rejoice in Him, right? And then we need to glorify the Lord with me. Glorify the Lord with me. We can't glorify the Lord and be lifted up alone. God said it is not good for Him to be alone, right? From the beginning, God made 
Adam a helpmeet comparable to him. It is not good for us to be alone. We need to glorify God together. Glorify God with others. When you're in that point and you're feeling down, Hi, Miss Sophia, I'm glad that you're here. You need to surround yourself with godly friends that are a godly influence, that are going to help you to lift up your hands to the Lord. God wants you to glorify Him, but you need to do it together. But you know why? Because Satan wants to tear you apart. And if you think you can glorify God alone, that is not possible. One tiny spark is not enough to start a fire. But when we have all our sparks together and we're all on fire for God, then there we are, then we're on the midst, right? We want to make sure that we are giving glory and honor to God and we don't want to allow Satan to squelch what he's, what God's put within, within us, right? We need to exalt his name together. Glorify him with me. Exalt his name together. God wants us to be able to be in fellowship and be able to be lifted up high. So give God the glory and the honor with others, right? Surround yourself with godly Christian friends that will help you and lift you up, right? And then finally, how are we going to walk in obedience? And that is... I didn't write it. We're going to walk in obedience to... I just wrote the page. That was kind of silly. Walking in obedience. Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28. Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28 is us walking in obedience. Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28. And this is God encouraging the people to live for him when they've gotten to the promised land. It's not enough once we get to the promised land to let down our guard and do whatever we want. You know, when God gets us to where we're supposed to be, that's when we got to live right. That's when we got to be on guard. That's when, when the devil wants to tear us apart. Because if we're where we're supposed to be, then we're doing the purposes God has, ha God has for us. But if we get slack while we're there, then guess what? We're going to fall short. And God is telling us, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, the curse, if you obey. The, the blessings that you're given today. The curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn away from the command, turn away to other gods which you have not known. So the blessing is when we obey and the curse is when we disobey. So the commands, of course, are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbors, all the Ten Commandments, all that good stuff. But we know what it is to obey the Lord. God wants us to listen to what he has in his word, right? So if we're obeying the word, then we're going to be blessed. If we're not obeying the word, then you're going to have a curse. And you know what? It's pretty much plain and simple. It's the same as your kids. If they do what they're supposed to do, they're going to be blessed. If they don't do what they're supposed to do, they're going to be cursed. Maybe not cursed. Maybe disciplined. It's a little harder a word. But yes, you get the idea, right? God is just being very plain with us. God is giving us a very simple direction. Obey what I've given you to do. And sometimes we make it more difficult than it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors as yourself. Have your relationship going this way right, so your relationships going this way can be right. And that's how we walk in obedience to God. Being right with God. Being right with who He is. We can only have a right relationship with God if we're in a relationship with God. If we don't have a relationship with God, we don't know what it means to ever be right with Him. I will never support one of those marathons where you raise money for every mile you run. I would be broke. But if you ever need donations for a worthy cause, let me know. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, in order for us to have that right relationship that we can give honor and glory to God, that we can be praising Him, that we can walk in obedience, and that we could live right with Him, we need to have a relationship with Him. What does it mean to have a relationship with Him? And we can look at the Romans road. We look at Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If we've all sinned, if we all fall short, then what hope do we have, right? But we do. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. 
but the gift of God is eternal life. So we don't have to fear death. We can know beyond a shadow of doubt, be that we have hope, that we have an eternal life. That's the offer that God gives us. That's the free gift of salvation that his son died for, for us. Romans 5, 8 says God's love for us was that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have that hope. We have that future. We know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, we can live for him. God's love for us is that while we were sinners, he died for us. So we have that hope of heaven. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, if we believe in our heart that God raised him to the dead, then we will be saved. But it's on our part. He's done all he can. He died for our sins. He's given us hope of heaven. We have to accept it. We have to take it up. We have to make it our own. So Romans 10, 9 through 10 says that if we confess with our mouth, it, it, it's on our part, confessing with our mouth, believing with our heart. So where is your mouth at today? What are you speaking about? Where is your heart at today? What, are you, what, is, what is the first love of your life? It should be that relationship with Christ. Have a great day, Andrew. Hi. <laughs> we should have that hope of heaven. We should have that love for the Lord. If you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, to have that personal relationship with him requires you having prayer with God. It's you coming before him, Lord. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I fall short. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you give me the hope of heaven. I confess that I'm a sinner and I need you. I confess that you are all that I need to have eternal life. I confess that you're the son of God and I desire to follow you. Thank you for the free gift of salvation. Thank you for allowing me to have that hope of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. So where are you at? Where are you at? If you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ now, where are you at? Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There are whosoever's in your life and mine that only we impact. So what do we need to do? We need to be, be sharing with them, be sharing the word, be sharing what's going on in our lives, be sharing how God is providing and doing more than we can possibly imagine, be sharing God with others. We need to be, be in the word. You need to be in the word so you can hear what God is saying to you. You need to be, be in prayer. You need to be talking to God so you have communion with him, right? And then you need to be, be involved in a Bible-believing church, a church that is going to grow you up and will help you you to grow others up. We need to be involved. We need to be there so God can use us wherever we're at, right? And as we are being used by God where we're at, then God will want to fill us with his Holy Spirit. God will want to continue to bless us. Why? Because we're his children. We're, we're his and he wants to bless us. And I know that's a hard concept for some people. The prayer of Jabez devotional that we're going through is just a wonderful way for you to understand that God has blessings abundant for you, that God wants to enlarge your territory, that God wants to be with you, and God wants to keep you from pain. The prayer of Jabez is in 1 Chronicles 4, 9, and 10, and it is an awesome way for you to refocus your mind on what is God doing in my life today we're finishing up uh, week one and it talks about oh Lord bless me indeed God wants to bless you we're talking about no limits today <laughs> Malachi 3:10. and try me now in this says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. That's the blessing God has for you. That's the blessing God wants to give you. That's the hope of the future that he has for you. God wants to give you blessings. Do you want to ask for them? Do you want to accept them? You have that hope, but we don't have it because we don't ask. The next time you leaf through the Old Testament, look for the God you might have missed. In all those restrictions and rebukes, try to see a caring father whose generosity is continually thwarted. Try to read the Bible not as a book of laws, but as the account of a very frustrated philanthropist, right? Everything you want and more, I'll give it to you and to your children. 
God promises the Israelites time and time again. We just read about that, how he promised to bless them if they obeyed, but that there would be a curse if they disobeyed, right? And you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. Deuteronomy 28, 3 and 6. How much better can things get than that? You're going to have be blessed. God's already telling them, right? For God's for God, limited resources are never the problem. Neither is reluctance or restraint. In fact, like any devoted parent, God must often have to restrain himself from blessing his kids too much. You, have, you never read of God saying to Israel, what do you mean, bless you again? God wants to bless us and bless us abundantly and bless us over and over and over again. That's the God we serve. But because of our disobedience, we don't receive that blessing because we don't ask, we don't have. And then we blame God as to why we're where we are when we haven't asked or when we're not right with him, right? God doesn't keep a ledger in heaven so that he won't over bless you at the expense of someone else. That's not possible, right? You can't use up your quota of God's goodness and you can't overestimate his tenderness toward his own. God wants to bless you abundantly. God wants to give you abundant blessing, but you have to ask. I love a story that is told about George Mueller, a great man of prayer. It illustrates how I can never be too greedy for God's blessing. For some reason, Mueller needed to move his family and his ministry to another part of England. All day, the workmen carried Mueller's household belongings over the hill and down to the barge that would take him to their new home. As the barge was about to push off from shore, they noticed that everything was safely on board except one thing, George Mueller's favorite chair. But the captain refused to delay his departure. So Mueller stood at the deck and prayed aloud, Oh, Lord, please hurry and bring me my chair. The captain, scoffing, at this minister who would bother Almighty God with such a silly request, ordered his crew to untie the mooring lines. Just then, a man crested the hill running. He was carrying George Mueller's favorite chair on his head. This is your father and mine, giving abundantly, lavishly, beyond all your expectations, is that he loves, is what he loves to do. It is his unalterable nature. And he is present with you today looking for yet another opportunity to bestow his very best. Is there some concern in your heart, some area where you desire God's favor that you've always felt was too personal, embarrassing, or silly to ask? Ask. You know, lay those silly things down at the Lord's feet. And when he answers them, give him all the glory and honor he deserves. I have asked for a prayer requests within the last few weeks that were not my own and God has answered them and those people have came back to me and said I don't know if you're praying because this was answered God wants to answer you can pray too I know they were praying too God answers prayer God answers prayer even the silly ones right he wants to bless you if your heart is right with him he wants to bless you take a minute to imagine how your life would change if God answered that concern, try to see yourself from your father's point of view and imagine how much he would love to prove his love to you in this way. Make this the day you cast away those doubts that limit his goodness. Like any loving father, God cares about your heart, about what matters to you. Nothing you could ask for is too silly for his attention. No nagging need or dream or ambition would put you beyond the quota of good things. He is able and willing to pass on to you. Trust him. Ask him today for what you want and keep your eye on the crest of the hill. So our general question is, since I can't possibly use up my quota of God's goodness and favor and desire to bless me today, what should I ask for? What should I ask for? And it's funny, Paul mentions how he'd be willing to support a worthy cause I'm, in the, I'm on the verge of finishing my book and starting speaking engagements for the, for the year 2017. So if you could keep me in prayer for that, that's where I'm at. I'm going to continue to want to do these devotionals in the morning, but I definitely want to start speaking and getting a larger audience and being able to witness to many more people and enlarging my territory, just like, just like the prayer of Jabez says. So if you can keep me in prayer for that, that's where I'm at as well. 
and that might require funds and that might be something I do in the near future once my book is complete. So I appreciate you guys being out there and supporting me. Um, if there is something to gain and nothing to lose by asking, by all means ask. W.C. Stone. So God has a plan and a purpose for you. God has a hope. God has a future. God wants to bless you and bless you abundantly with the right heart, with the right mindset, to give him all the glory and honor he deserves. Ask, ask, God wants to bless you indeed. And I pray you do have a blessed day. And as you ask for those blessings, you can give him all the glory and honor to the whosoever's in your life. Thanks so much, I hope you have a blessed day.